Okay, so um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to um, the uh, actually our final session on variations of the magnetic field through Earth's history. And uh, we've got um, a really interesting lineup of some talks here. And we're going to start with uh, Brendan Riley. He's a, a Scripps postdoctoral fellow who came to us from Oregon State University about a year ago. And uh, he's going to tell us about new magnetostratigraphic insights from Iceberg Alley on the rhythms of the Antarctic climate during the Pleistocene. So, um, Brendan, if you want to take over the screen, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Kathy, for the introduction, and, and thanks to the MAGIC team for putting on this workshop. Um, it's been really great so far. I'm going to talk about some results um, that came out of uh, an IODP expedition from 2019 to Iceberg Alley, which is in the Scotia Sea offshore Antarctica, and what we can learn about um, from the magnetic stratigraphy about the evolution of Antarctic climate over um, the last three, three and a half million years or so. And so this is work that I've been doing as a postdoc at Scripps. Um, but of course, with, with all of these expeditions, uh, it's really you know, been a, a fun team effort to work with uh, the whole science party on. Um, so first, I'm just going to talk about magnetic stratigraphy and um, pleiopleistocene climate. And when I've presented this work, I'd like to start with this figure. Um, this is a figure from a paper by Neil Updike and colleagues from 1966. Uh, and, it, and it was, I, I think as, as most of the people here will know, like th this is a paper that really defined where the field of magnetic stratigraphy was gonna go um, in terms of understanding the evolution of Earth's climate history. Um, here, famously, they're, you know, they're showing the, the onset of where we find ice rafted debris in these sediment cores around the Southern Ocean in the sub-Antarctic region um, and showing that, that they typically occur around or just before the Gauss-Matayama boundary or, or as, as we know today around the Pleistocene boundary. And since this time, there's been a lot of work done to try to intercalibrate um, the magnetostratigraphic timescale or magnetostratigraphy with, with other timescales. And for the, the Pleistocene, the backbone of the marine stratigraphy is, is typically benthic oxygen isotopes. And um, in this talk, the data that I'll present, we're looking at cores that are from close to Antarctica and beneath the CCDs. So, so we can't get benthic oxygen isotopes um, in our record, but ultimately it's something that we want to compare to because this is the backbone of, of um, our understanding of global Pleistocene climate evolution. And, and so the point I want to make in, in this figure here, this is from a paper by Shackleton and colleague, Shackleton and colleague, 1990. And um, here they're revising the ages of, of some reversals, including the Jaramillo, um, based on uh, timescales that were, were originated from cores from the Atlantic, um, using these new cores at the time from the, the uh, Eastern Equatorial Pacific. And, and the point here is that, that, you know, even in this case, even though the ages might change of these reversals, their stratigraphic position relative to oxygen isotopes doesn't. And so at the time here was the shading is the uncertainty of where those reversals were. The time scale I'll be using in this talk um, is highlighted, the approximate position where the reversals would be is highlighted in, in yellow. So that the stratigraphy stays the same, even if the ages change. Um, and, and so I'm sure most people here are familiar with, with this data set. This is the LRO4 benthic oxygen isotope stack um, showing the evolution of, of, of climate, um, specifically uh, reflecting global ice volume and deep sea temperature. And, and you can see the transition from the, the warmer Pliocene into the colder and more variable Pleistocene. Um, and the the rhythms at which these variations are occurring evolve through this time as well, and in addition to the, the more obvious signals here. Um, so if you did a, a frequency analysis on the 
auction isotopes of the Bruins Cron, you get this really characteristic light Pleistocene, 100,000 year cyclicity. Um, versus if you go to the Matayama Cron, um, that 100,000 year, your, your signal um, is, is much smaller and um, the signal is then becomes dominated by the 41,000 year um, period. Uh, and, and this, you know, this time period is often called the 41,000 year world. And, and this transition between the two occurs um, in this time period in the late Matayama from about the, the Cobb Mountain subcron to the Bruins Matayama reversal. And of course, these variations are related to changes in Earth's orbit, specifically the eccentricity, the obliquity or the tilt, and the precession and the wobble. Um, and, and each one of these variations has a, a characteristic frequency and um, different ways it can impact the Earth's climate system. And so here, instead of looking at, at, at these, these just time intervals and looking at where the peaks are, if we take a, a moving window of 400,000 years and, and integrate what those peaks look like um, in terms of these characteristic is associated with the eccentricity or around 100,000 year frequency, obliquity uh, 41 and precession, which is 19 and 23. Um, for the benthic oxygen isotope signal, this is looking at the last 4 million years. Um, the black line is, is the, um, the power within that frequency band um, associated with each one of these frequencies. So you can see this characteristic increase in um, the the power within the eccentricity band through the mid-Pleistocene transition, which isn't related to a change in orbital forcing and is often referred, uh, often considered to be a reflection of a nonlinear change in the climate system. Um, in the obliquity frequency band, you see these variations that occur on uh, slightly more than million year timescales uh, in amplitude. And if you go back 5 million years, the beginning of this LRO4 benthic oxygen isotope stack, these relative changes track the orbital, the amplitude modulation of, of the tilt of the obliquity angle. Um, so, so it has a proportional response to the, to the uh, orbital forcing until about 1.4 million years as you go into the mid Pleistocene transition where the, the, twos, the, the climate system response decouples from the direct orbital forcing. Um, and then in the precession frequency band, we see this increase in the late Pleistocene where we have stronger amplitude in the precession frequencies that isn't associated with uh, any change in the orbital forcing. But as um, Lasecki and Ramo pointed out in their 2007 paper, if you detrend um, the, these changes in amplitude um, to reflect the change in variance within the stack, um, you can see that, that we're still seeing um, direct responses to the orbital forcing. Um, you can see that in the precession frequency band, there's, there's a nice match between the forcing and the climate response. Um, same thing with the obliquity band. Um, and then you see this sort of opposite response in the, in the eccentricity band, um, which uh, Lorraine Lasecki talks about more in her uh, 2010 paper. Um, so the, the point where I'm going here is that is that it's not in the 41,000 year world, it's not that the precession response in the climate system is totally absent. There's just some mechanism that, that, that's muting it relative to the, the late Pleistocene. And so one way to explain this, th there are a number of hypotheses to try to explain why you don't see strong precession forcing in the Matiamacron or in the 41,000 year world. Um, one of which, which I'm going to talk more about it here is the, um, the idea of the antiphase hypothesis. And, and so the basic premise here is that the, um, the impact that precession has on insulation or, or peak summer insulation is going to be antiphase in the two hemispheres just based on, um, on, on how the earth wobbles. So during time periods where you have peak summer insulation in the northern hemisphere, you'll have um, less summer insulation in the southern hemisphere and, and vice versa. So, so just to illustrate this concept, if you um, say we have this, this really simple climate system on Earth that has a direct linear response to um, peak summertime insulation, and we have a climate record from the northern hemisphere and a climate record from the southern hemisphere, 
Um, and, and these records look like this. And so they're responding to summer insulation. And so we have very strong variability within the precession frequencies and less variability in the, um, the obliquity frequency. Um, if then say we integrated that or, or that signal into some sort of global record, um, like what benthic oxygen isotopes is, um, as a result of destructive interference, uh, that precession signal becomes muted because the precession component of these two signals is out of phase. And so you're left with a much stronger um, signal in the, uh, in the obliquity frequency band in the 41,000 year um, period because, uh, uh, because that's the common signal between the two records. So um, if we wanted to change the amplitude of the precession frequency in the globally integrated signal, um, we could change the relative contribution of one hemisphere relative to the other. So say here now the northern hemisphere contributes in, in a way that's greater than the southern hemisphere to this globally integrated signal. Um, then all of a sudden th the, the strength of those precession frequencies changes relative to the obliquity frequency. So, so the prediction that, that, that comes out of the antiphase hypothesis is if you could isolate the signal associated with just one of the hemisphere's ice sheets, um, you'd expect to see precession pace variations in what benthic Deli Tino would define as the 41,000 year world. Um, and and so, so that's, that's where we're gonna go with this. There's been a little work done in the Northern hemisphere that's shown uh, precession Paste variability and in, in say like runoff through the Mississippi River, but but um, we're going to take a look at these cores we recovered from Expedition 382 and Iceberg Alley, which which I think um, can provide, uh, or or I'm going to try to convince you um, is our records that we can use to to test this hypothesis. And so here's an animation of icebergs coming off the Antarctic continent. Um, and these colors represent different geologic bedrock areas. So, so you know, the, the detrital load in these icebergs, you could potentially track back to each one of these sectors of the continent. And you'll see that there's an increase in icebergs as we move through time. Um, that's just related to our, our improved ability to observe icebergs. It, it doesn't actually reflect the, the overall flux. And, and so you can see that as icebergs come off the continent, they travel counterclockwise in the Antarctic coastal current, a lot of them do at least, until they enter the Weddell Sea and they, they um, are travel around the Weddell Sea gyre and are shot off into the, the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is a warmer water mass where the icebergs melt and, and will deposit their terrigenous load. And so the idea with Expedition 382 was to drill um, right here in the Scotia Sea that's within the path of these icebergs um, and that provides a way of looking at um, iceberg flux off the Antarctic continent, um, specifically um, well biased towards the Weddell Sea, but, but potentially carrying signals from, from further away on the continent. Um, and so we sailed on the Jodius Resolution, leaving Punta Arenas. I'm going to be talking mostly about these sites here in the sea. Um, here are just pictures from the expedition. Here, here were the, my fellow paleomagnetists from the, the leg, uh, Stephanie Brackfeld and Lisa Tokes. Um, and, and usually here on, uh, in the, when I'm presenting this data, I, 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 um, I was lucky to sail with IODP as a graduate student and then again as a postdoc. Um, and it was a really great experience for me at times. Uh, and so I really encourage all the, the young paleomagnetists here to try to get involved in DP. It's a really great program. Um, and, and paleomagnetists have sailed on, you know, I, probably every leg or almost every leg of, um, of the program. And, and so it's a really great way to um, sort of expand your, your science. Uh, and, and you might see some cool things too while you're up there. But um, so these are the sites here. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, or about these sites U1536 and U1537, which are both from the Dove Basin, which is a tectonic basin within the Scotia Sea. And the deposit that we are drilling was a contrite um, or a drift deposit. And so 
through bottom currents um, moving through this area, sediment are focused into the into the drift deposit, which which provides a, a high resolution sedimentary record from the deep sea, um, making it a, a nice site to work um, from a paleomagnetic perspective. Um, the the sites that we drill, this is a figure from the initial report um, showing a summary of some of the magnetic, many of stratigraphic data, as well as um, the natural gamma radiation, um, which is a, a proxy for lithologic variability. The important thing here is that you see this alternation between um, sort of low NGR values and high NGR values. The low values uh, represent intervals of, of higher biogenic content. There's still a lot of terrigenous content there, but, but they have more diatoms. And in the late Pleistocene, at least, that's representative of warmer times. Um, as these, these areas of high NGR have more terrigenous material. And, and so like, say for example, this interval here was deposited during the last glacial maximum. Um, and so, so we, we, you know, we kind of interpret those as being cold times. So biogenic is warm, Terrigenous seems to be cold. Um, and what was particularly uh, great about these two sites was that they had well-resolved magnetic stratigraphies, especially for site U1537, um, which was drilled during a uh, fairly calm sea state. Uh, and, this, and this really strong imprint of uh, orbital scale variability within their lithostratigraphy. Um, and, and so what, what I think you know, kind of captured a lot of attention on the ship initially is, is if you take one of these proxies for lithologic variability, here I'm showing a, a figure from um, a, a paper that, that's been submitted by one of the co-chief scientists, uh, Mike Weber, um, showing uh, log transform magnetic susceptibility compared to that LRO4 benthic oxygen isotope stack. You can see during the Brunskron if you do a little wiggle wishing and, and, and you know, line things up the way that, that you think it, it might work, there's actually a really nice correlation between the benthic oxygen isotopes and that log transformed magnetic susceptibility. Um, it's pretty remarkable from my perspective, at least. Uh, and, and that relationship seems to continue to somewhere between the Bruns Matiama boundary and the upper Jaramillo, um, maybe around like 900,000 years ago or so. And, and then when you go before that, you, you can still try to match those two up, but, but I don't think it's as quite as clear. Like I think a lot of these, the amplitudes don't match up quite as well. You have a little weirdness in the correlation, like you might be missing some features. And, and so to me that that was, saying that it would be interesting to try to dig into that a little bit more. Does this, does this relationship with benthic oxygen isotopes continue all the way back in time, or is it really just a, a feature of the, say like the Brunskron or like the post 900,000 year uh, time interval? And so um, because we have good magnetic stratigraphy and, and these orbital signals, um, for the, what I'm gonna present here, uh, we're, we're trying to ask what questions can we address and still be honest about age uncertainty, you know, without making too many assumptions about how we think lithology relates to, to things like orbital curves or to the, the benthic Delatino record. And so, so I'm going to say, you know, sort of three guiding principles that, that are, are where we're going to go with this. And so one, we're going to acknowledge that our age models have uncertainty. We, you know, the further you get away from where there's a magnetic reversal, the larger that uncertainty is going to become. And that the time scales that we're comparing to are also dependent on assumptions of how they relate to, to orbital forcing. Um, and so the way that we'll get around this is that we're, we're going to use the L04 time scale, but we're going to use the reversal positions as they're defined in site U1308 in the northern North Atlantic, which has a really high resolution. Um, record of inclination to get at uh, the reversal stratigraphy as well as uh, an incredibly high resolution benthic Delhi Tino record. Um, the second thing is we're gonna focus on signals that operate on frequencies um, that are similar to or longer than the frequencies of reversals. And so, so this will be looking at the amplitude modulation of our signals um, and, and how those evolve through time, like, like we looked at earlier comparison between benthic deletino and the orbital 
uh, forcing. And the third thing is we're gonna then just take a closer look at the phasing of some of these climate signals relative to magnetic reversals, both where they're well-defined relative to benthic oxygen isotopes, and then in our records where they're well-defined relative to um, lithology. So, so for um, here's just what some of these magnetizations look like, um, or some of these directions look like. Uh, most of the samples that we did detailed demagnetization on um, seem to behave pretty well. Here are some representative um, orthogonal projection plots of, of those. Uh, although we did have some that were a little more complicated. Uh, and so here are two examples of, of what those might look like. One flavor of the more complicated directions look like this. Um, we interpret these as just being related to very weak NRM intensities and, and us having difficulty uh, measuring the discrete samples uh, while at, on, at sea on ship. Um, the other, in the, in the light colors here, um, are various measurements made in three mutually perpendicular, perpendicular directions, each after AFD magnetization. And so these suggest that there's a spurious magnetization that is um, being acquired during AFD magnetization. Um, this was more of a, an issue at site U13, uh, U1536, U1536 uh, rather than U1537. But to dig into this a little bit more, um, this is the plot that Lisa put together um, that I like. Uh, in this here, we're plotting the magnetic moment of the NRM um, versus the circular standard deviation of those three measurements after three different AF demagnetization orientations at 15 millitesla. Um, and so you can see when, when there are high circular standard deviations, typically they're related to uh, low magnetic intensities. Um, but there are some instances where at, from site U1536 where you know, we think that there's this spurious magnetization forming um, like these here. Um, but but if, you, if you focus on just the samples that have uh, low circular standard deviations, um, you get this nice distribution that looks like a GAD-like field in our, in our inclinations. Um, but I, I think that the, uh, this is a terrible figure to show in a talk, but the, the takeaway, <laughs> the takeaway that I, I think um, I want to make here is that um, even though we're working with um, data, so here I'm plotting all the data, not doing any filtering. So this is includes coring disturbance, including where we have IRD, it includes these low intensity intervals that we had difficulty resolving. Um, but the um, the lithologic variations at both site U1536 and U1537, tracked by this NGR parameter, um, are remarkably similar. And when we correlate the two sites to each other based on those lithologic abilities, we get the same answer in terms of the position of where these reversals occur relative to lithologic changes. And so, and so this ability to, to replicate that signal, to me, is the best evidence for that we have a reliable uh, magnetic stratigraphy. Uh, here what the age models look like, where you can see uh, our, our quantification of uncertainty increases, of course, as you move further away from the reversals. Um, the accumulation rates are pretty high here. In the, in the Pliocene, the late Pliocene, um, accumulation rates are a little lower. They're, you know, they're on the, the scale of five to 10 centimeters per thousand years. Uh, in the Bruins crumb, they get higher, um, 20 centimeters per thousand years or, or greater. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at amplitude modulation. And so I'm gonna show, well, first I guess I'll, I'm gonna show the what the, our record looks like. Um, so here I'm just plotting one parameter. This is the gamma ray attenuation density um, with the values plotting up indicate these more biogenic intervals. The values plotting now down indicate these more terrigious materials. So, so this would be warmer this would be colder. Um, and you can see in just uh, sort of the long-term variation of the mean values um, that they seem to vary on time scales that, are, that look like how um, the amplitude modulation of, of, of orbital forcing um, varies. So to, to dig into that more, um, I'm going to show you some plots like we looked at earlier with the, the comparison of the orbital forcing to, to LRO4. So starting with um, 
looking at uh, obl the obliquity or the frequency band um, associated with obliquity around 41,000 year world, uh, 41,000 years. Um, here's the, uh, here's what orbital forcing looks like. It's really characteristic uh, 1.2 million year amplitude modulation period um, in the, uh, in the orbital forcing itself. Um, if you plot up um, what the benthic Delitino record looks like, you see um, this, uh, you know, that, that in the earlier part of the record, it's tracking forcing at 1.4 million years. As we go into the mid-place transition, it decouples. Um, and then if we do the same analysis on our Dove Basin, um, looking at density, so this alternation between the biogenic and the, um, the pterygenous facies, the in the Dove Basin record with on C that we propagate from the uncertainty DH model uh, looks a lot more like our, our understanding of global ice volume than it does look like the orbital forcing. So, so that tells us that this frequency Lithology in Dove Basin and global ice volume has a similar history. Uh, we can do the same thing with eccentricity. Um, here we're just looking at the benthic DLTNO showing the increase in 100,000 year power. Um, Dove Basin shows that same increase in 100,000 year power, again, suggesting that it looks more like globally integrated ice volume than direct orbital forcing. But this changes when we look at the precession frequency bands. This is orbital forcing here. Here is that um, LRO4 where you see the increase in the power, higher, higher power in precession in the late Pleistocene re relative to the early Pleistocene. Um, in Dove Basin, uh, we see um, we don't see an increase in the in the power of in the precession frequency bands. There's there's um, there's variability within that frequency band in the late Pliocene and early Pleistocene. Um, with the exception of this kind of interesting interval here around the old device subtron, which, which I'll show you um, a little bit more data in, in a second. Um, but the, the takeaway from that is that at the eccentricity and obliquity frequency bands, the dove basin lithology is looking like our understanding of global ice volume, but the precession frequency band, it's looking different. And so to dig into that more, uh, I'm just going to show you a couple figures uh, of what the lithology looks like right at these magnetic reversals um, where our age control is the best. And so in, th in this plot here, I've got um, three subcrons, the Cayena, the Reunion, and the Old Dubai. Um, so late Pliocene and early Pleistocene subcrons. Um, and just to, to show that uh, what the, the actual stratigraphy looks like in the gray here, I have plotted the inclination record from site U1537, which was our, our cleaner um, reverse, our, our cleaner paleomagnetic record. And above it, I've got the inclination record from site U1308 in the Northern North Atlantic um, that uh, Channel and colleagues have worked on. Um, site U1308 has this really beautiful and high resolution auction isotope record, so we can make a direct comparison to how these, um, where these reversals fall relative to auction isotopes. Um, and, and that allows us to, to put this record onto the LRO4 timescale, um, which has, uh, you know, names for all these glacials and, and interglacial intervals. Um, this is what the, the gamma ray attenuation looks like for the basin. So plotting up are the warmer intervals, the biogenic intervals, plotting down are the colder intervals or the pterygenous intervals. Um, and for good measure, I, um, I'll throw some of these orbital curves, but remember, we only have a direct stratigraphic relationship to the oxygen isotopes. And then there's, you know, an extra step to make the connection to the orbital curves. But the point here is if you look at the Cayena, um, you know, so you look at the lower Cayena, it occurs at this transition from um, a prominent late Pliocene glacial interval KM2 into this uh, KM1 interglacial. In our record, we find it in uh, the middle of a cold interval. Um, we also see um, variability within the Cayena subcron that, that it, you know, more variability than you see in the, um, the benthic oxygen isotopes. And again, the upper Cayena doesn't look like where it falls in benthic. So the takeaway here is that um, 
our record looks different, one, and, and two, some of the variability here um, is consistent with procession-paced variability. Uh, it's the same story if you look at the reunion subcron. The, the reunion um, spans this early um, interglacial MIS-81 and um, into glacial, or this sort of small glacial MIS-80 in benthic oxygen isotopes. Um, in our record, again, the signal looks different and the variability is, is consistent with procession-paced variability um, through the reunion subcron. Uh, the story is a little, seems a little bit more complicated when you look at the old device subcron. This is a period that had uh, low amplitude modulation in both the precession and obliquity frequency bands. And that's something that we have to dig into a little bit more. You, you could maybe convince yourself that you see some evidence of precession phase variability, but, but I think that this is, this is something that, that we're going to have to dig into a little bit more. Um, uh, and and you, could, you, know, you could also make the argument that you think that uh, some of this variability is similar to oxygen isotopes. Um, the story changes. This is the same, you know, the same layout for the figure now, but looking at, at um, the subcrons and reversals around uh, you know, 700,000 to 1.2 million years ago. Um, if you look at the Bruns Matayama boundary, um, we see it in the late stages of a warm interval, which is consistent where it's typically found relative to benthic oxygen isotopes in the late stages of marine isotope stage 19. Um, the, uh, the upper Jaramillo position seems consistent with where you see it in the um, oxygen isotopes, same with the upper Cobb Mountain at this transition from MIS 36 to 35, this transition from a cool to a warm interval. Um, however, th this is kind of interesting that the, the, lower, um, the lower boundary of, of the, the Jaramillo subcron um, doesn't fall within a prominent warm interval as you might expect um, based on where it falls in the, in the oxygen isotopes. And so, so here it, it suggests that, that the signals appear to be coming more similar, but you know, potentially with, with some intervals where um, the signals are out of phase again, um, you know, in this case, falling in this interval during this, this period of, of, of high amplitude in, in the precession um, forcing. And so, um, so the takeaway from all this is that uh, we, we see in our lithostratigraphy um, in frequency bands that we would expect to be similar between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere um, as, as, a, as a similar history uh, in this, the Antarctic proximal sediments at, in Dove Basin um, to globally integrated ice flame. But the precession frequency band it seems that, that there are at least some intervals in what's considered to be the 40,000 year world based on benthic oxygen isotopes um, where, where we do see uh, a strong precession response in Antarctic climate um, in, in the Antarctic proximal record. And, and so, so moving forward, we have to do a lot of work to, to better understand what these lithologic variability, these lithologic variations really mean um, and also explore other avenues to, to create higher resolution chronologies. But if you're interested in any of this work, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that as of a couple of days ago, um, the paper associated with this is uh, what I presented today is in press or, and you can find it online at paleoceanography and paleoclimatology. So uh, thanks for joining in and, and sorry for running a few minutes late. That's okay. We still have a few minutes for questions. So if somebody has some, uh, feel free to pipe up or drop it into the chat, whatever suits. Okay, so uh, seeing a question from Kenton Simon, um, do you want to ask it or shall I read it? He's uh, asking what the average sedimentation rates are in the cores. Yeah, yeah. So the um, so it's so it's variable in in the um, in the older part of the time they're a little bit lower than than in the late Pleistocene. 
So in the Pliocene interval, um, we're looking at accumulation rates on the order of like five to, to 10 centimeters or so per thousand years. They're, they're higher at site U1536 than at site U1537. Um, and then in the Bruins cron, uh, we see the highest accumulation rates. Uh, at site U1537, they're around 20 centimeters per thousand years. At site U1536, they're a little higher than that. So, so I've actually got a question in terms of uh, improving the stratigraphy. Where would you go to do that? Um, so yeah. one of the things that we're working on is we're, we're, we're um, exploring relative paleo intensity uh, to mm -hmm. see if we can make connections to sites like U1308 or other sites that have relative paleo intensity records that are intercalibrated with benthic oxygen isotopes. Um, Based on the shipboard data, we, we think that the, the most likely time interval that we'll, we could have success with this is in the, um, the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene interval that seems to have the, the cleanest paleomagnetic signal. Um, and the preliminary data we have so far around the, the Gauss-Matayama boundary looks pretty good when you compare it to sites like, um, say like site U1314, which also has a nice relative paleo intensity record to that time interval. Okay. Uh, more questions here? Yeah. Could I ask a quick question? What What is your your original hypothesis was to check this canceling out of precession from the two hemispheres? So, what did you learn about that? I mean, you were going there with that in in mind, right? Yeah. Well, so the so the the hypothesis would predict that we would see precession paced variability in our site. And which, which we do see during time periods where based on oxygen isotopes alone, you would expect there to be a, just a dominant 41,000 year variability. But the, um, you, to really test the hypothesis, now we have to make the connection between the lithologic variability and variations in the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, because you know, these sediments, we, you know, we think that, that they're showing variability in the Antarctic ice sheet, but they could also be showing oceanographic changes or, or paleo productivity changes. Um, and, and so that's that's sort of the next step of this. But but yeah, I mean it, it would if you if you make the leap to say that the lithologic variability, that the lithologic variability is a reflection of Antarctic ice sheet changes, um, then it would suggest that there is this precession signal in the early Pleistocene that's um, that or, or at least Antarctic ice sheet variability was paced by precession during yeah. that time period. All right, great, thank you. 